families that are going through things. I could just give you a list this morning. Um, and uh, also for Marianne Valar's uh, brother David, going through from some very serious health problems. And Marianne lost her, her other brother not too long ago, and we want to lift her up to the Lord. But pray for the body of Christ right now. There just seems to be a sense of that need right now. And uh, continue to pray for Jack and Bertha and uh, her healing uh, for Bertha. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a time right now for some reason. You know, we just need, we just need to be doing that to make, make a matter of prayer uh, a top priority uh, right now. Uh, like I said, there's a few other families that are suffering some great uh, loss right now, and I can't share those things with you, but uh, if you, God knows, and so you pray uh, if you would. Um, something just came into my head and left as soon as it came in there. So, But uh, anyway, you know how that works. So uh, it'll, it'll probably come back around to me. But uh, I, saw, I saw Mr. Millville in the house. Just had total knee replacement this week, and he's here. So figure that one out. That's, that's, a, that's a cool thing right there. So anyway, yeah, that's what popped into my head. I had to look over. I had to see you over there just to see if it was really you. So amen. Praise the Lord. So God is good, and uh, continue to pray for his healing as well. He's, he's up for another one pretty soon. And uh, he liked the first one so much that, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, God is good, and he's going to answer these other needs too. We're trusting him and believing him. Uh, but uh, the body of Christ, the families that represent the church here, there's a great need right now. And uh, several people not with us today because of circumstances. And uh, if you would, make that a matter of prayer. So let's go to the Lord. Father God, we, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And Lord, uh, so many on our hearts today. And Father, sometimes we get so busy and we get so caught up in what seems to be uh, so urgent that we forget about what's important. And Lord, prayer is ultimately the most important thing. Our dependency and reliance on you, uh, intercessory prayer on the behalf of others. Lord, may we be those people. May we do that work of the ministry. So many need your touch, Lord, that we have mentioned today and several others that we haven't. God need an intervention. They need the Spirit, God. And you know our needs even before we ask. You know the cry of your children. And uh, we want to be sensitive today. There's so many who are hurting, so many who are struggling, uh, not just with the COVID thing, but uh, tragedy. Think of the Larson family as well, Chuck's uh, niece being, uh, being taken, Lord, in a tragic accident as well. And uh, God, we uh, just know that you love us in spite of all of these things. Uh, Father, we grow weary at times, and Lord, we uh, just need, Lord, your encouragement and uh, where better can it come from than, than your Holy Spirit? And so we call upon you today, God, to hear our prayer. We call upon you, God, to move in our hearts. We pray, God, that uh, you would do these things that we aren't capable of doing. And God, we know that uh, all things are possible with you, Lord. And so we trust you where we don't understand. And God, we call upon your healing touch in, in so many lives, especially, Lord, for... Um, Patty uh, Thaler's uh, niece's husband, Dan, Lord, uh, just uh, so many things wrong there now because of this, this very, very tragic accident. And uh, he, Father, has so many things he's up against. And Lord, I pray you'd heal this young man. I pray, God, that you would uh, work in that situation. Lord, we love you. We could spend the entire service Lord, on our knees before you, we need you. We need you every hour. God, we pray that you would uh, meet with us today. Encourage hearts, speak, Lord, where our words are not adequate in a way that um, only you can. And Father, we, we praise you because you're on the throne and you're in control of all things. And you're 
working and you're ruling and reigning in the affairs of men. Continue through these things that we suffer uh, to cause us to be more like Jesus. Not that you cause these things, but please, oh God, use these things. And Lord, as uh, Rich said in a, in a service a few weeks ago, uh, sometimes we see things as if they were falling apart all around us. But Lord, truly, they're falling into place. Uh, God, because uh, you have an eternal plan, and we're privileged to be a part of it. Uh, we love you, we praise you, we dedicate this service to you, and it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. And this morning, let's stand together. But as you can see, Doug is not coming alone. The cloud. 
may be seated. Good singing, church. That came from somewhere down deep in your soul, didn't it? Amen. You, you, you hear the cry, don't you? Hey, God, God is among us, and he is with us, and um, we are privileged to be a part of his plan. And uh, don't lose sight or focus of who is on the throne. Angel joined with me this morning up here. I love putting him on the spot. <laughs> but uh, we, do, we do our prayer time differently every week. Sometimes the elders are up here standing, and uh, you know they're here for you to pray with. And by the way, they're here with you through the week, too, to pray with you. Just make sure you have one of their numbers, you know. They'll be glad to pray with you. And, um, but um, from time to time, I, I ask Mr. Flores to come up here. He is our men's um, ministry leader as far as our men's prayer ministry is concerned but it goes it goes far beyond that god has given them a, a true heart for the body of christ and uh, hey th there's nothing sweeter when brothers and sisters get together to pray you know our differences whatever they might be however satan is trying to attack whatever he's trying to divide he cannot stand up against the power of prayer folks he just can't do that. And uh, we need to be that. We need to understand Christianity is not what we do. Christianity is who we are. And uh, prayer must be the front runner of that. And uh, Angel, we need a fresh touch. We need God's move. People are hurting. A lot of things are going on. And... Um, He's on the throne. Pray over us, would you? Okay. God, I just pray that you would speak specifically today. God, draw us 
they sense your purpose. May they sense your draw. And Lord, if there's any heart that's here that does not know you, God, Father, we know that they are here by your divine intervention, by your divine plan. And I pray that you would draw them to yourself this morning. God, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your eternal word. Lord, you said that you give us your word, Father. And Lord, that you, you said that as the snow and as the precipitation comes down, Lord, your word so comes down and it returns not to you void. But it will accomplish, O oh God, the purposes and the plans of God where did you send it. And I pray that you would open up our hearts and we would receive your word today, God. That we would receive what you would have to speak to us, O oh God. And that we would go forth from this place encouraged, Father, filled with the purposes of the Lord. The purposes and the design that you have for our lives, God. That we would be your people, O oh God, fit unto every good work. We give you praise today. We give you thanksgiving today, God, for you are worthy of it. And Lord, we pray, God, have your way in our hearts and our lives today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Cool. Um, we just want to encourage you in the new year as well. You know, we... Uh, we haven't we haven't passed the offering plate in over a year and a half, and um, I'm not just saying that about money or giving. I'm talking to you this morning about worship, worshiping through which God has blessed us and has met our needs, and so that's on your hearts to respond to to give accordingly, and you know we we can't outgive God. Uh, and, and God is the one who promises to meet our needs according to his riches and glory. And you know what we're doing here, you know, it, it's totally on faith. Totally on faith. There's no twisting of arms. There's none of that. And I don't want to be a part of any of that. But, you know, please give to what is an eternal work. You know, you can't put a price tag on that. You know, so that we can we can support the the missionaries that have been raised up even through this church. Uh, we have a young lady in in Cambodia, Sarah. She's one of our missionaries. You know, and uh, in our in our budget for the new year, uh, you know, we've we've enhanced our giving to our missionaries again, and um, we hope that you're a part of that. And we're stepping out in faith. It doesn't always work out on, on, on paper, does it, folks? In your budget at home, it doesn't always work out. But we need to trust them by faith. And uh, we encourage you to, to give. Give, and, uh, and, he, and he will he'll meet these needs and the desires of your hearts. And so, just with that said, the offering plates are here, the vehicle of online, and the mail, and uh, however, uh, as God leads you. But it, it is worship. It is, it is worshiping the Lord with what he has blessed you with and sharing with him that he's our source and we recognize that all good things come from him and uh, we are privileged to give with, uh, with a, a, a gracious uh, heart. You know, God has so truly blessed us and I, and I hope that you'll be a part of that. And um, we don't talk about it a lot, but when we talk about it, I want you to be blessed because of it. And um, that's truly a testimony and experience that uh, um, those who, who, who do that understand. I give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. So God sow into your life, you know. And um, I, I challenge you with that, to, to step out in faith in this new year uh, in regard to that. Well, you know, we're, we're to praise the Lord all the time, aren't we? in the good times and the tough times and we praise him in the storm we praise him you know on the mountaintop it's a lot easier it seems to praise him on the mountaintop i've i've learned one thing you know when when you're going through difficult times or in the valley uh, it's easier to have a a, a a consistent prayer life but you know god wants that to be constant sometimes going to god in prayer is not about asking him for anything it's just thanking him for who he is and that he's able, and that uh, we recognize him as, as the one who's on the throne. Um, we, need, we need to get lost in the presence of God and uh, allow our needs just to be cast on him so we're free to worship. 
free to worship him. And, and I pray that your experience going into the new year, you'll, you'll grow in these things. Uh, doesn't, nothing does uh, the heart of a pastor any, any greater, I, I didn't put that well, but uh, there's no greater blessing to the heart of a pastor than to see people fall in love with Jesus and to grow in faith. And you know how you love one another more? By knowing more about him. And uh, that, that'll increase your love and intensity for the things of God and, and uh, be a part of things. And um, I, want, I want you to know that, that you're important to this church. And um, there's a lot of people here not, not hearing that today. But, uh, you know, we're, we're not perfect. One day we will be. But don't expect that out of us today, because it ain't happening. <laughs> you know, we're we're just trying to be real, and uh, no, no glitter, no none of that kind of stuff. We want to do we want to do business with God, and we want to do it together. And uh, there's no place I'd rather. Let's worship Him in the storm, guys. And uh, there's a lot to be thankful for. He's praiseworthy, and He inhabits the praise of His children. Let's stand together. <laughs> do the first song. He liked the first song. Then out of nowhere he'd go, kick it up a notch, Dougie. <laughs> this is the notch.
love is eat you. The dry bones become you. You're my joy, my righteousness. You're my all. 
You may be seated. And I pray again that it would be the desire of our hearts as a church, corporately, and um, that we would just know him more and know that he is the best and he is indeed our righteousness. And, um, you know, it reminds me of a, a verse that uh, has been so very precious to me over the years. Um, we kind of call them our life verses, you know, but uh, this, this one kind of resonated with me for a long time, and it, it's kind of like a goal. It, it's, it's, uh, but I want this to be for you. I want this to be for our, our church in the new year, and um, it's, it's Philippians 3.10, and that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Make that, a, make that a prayer and desire of your heart, folks, this year, that uh, you will settle for nothing less than to knowing, knowing the, the knowledge and, and, and bounding in, in the love of Christ because of that overwhelming knowledge of all that he is. You know, and we're not even going to be able to get our minds around that to the, to the degree that uh, we'll know it in his presence one day. But, you know, just to, to desire him and uh, to prefer him over everything else and anything else. And I pray you'd embrace that, that passage of Scripture as a challenge and as a goal in the new year. And, you know, the things of the Lord aren't burdensome. They're for us to delight in. And uh, what an outcome to know him more and to know, to know the depth of those things to participate with him in. Um, we can deal with suffering a whole lot better when we know that it, it's an instrument that uh, God can take and use to form Christ in us. It's not about us sitting around trying to figure it out, you know. Uh, it's, it's about having faith to believe that, that uh, God is on the throne and some things we'll never figure out on this side of eternity, you know. And uh, what we need to embrace is the fact that he is who he says he is and we don't have to go there. We don't have to figure it out. He has it all figured out. Right, Rich? You, 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 you said that thing to me, and it just resonates, you know? Things aren't falling apart. They're just falling into place, you know? But, hey, that, that's, that's great stuff. And uh, we, we, we need to see things a little bit differently than just the, the average Joe in the street, you know? When, when you're in Christ, we see things with the eyes of Jesus and the heart of God. And then I hope that is true for you. Um, not to say we, we don't have our hearts broken, not to say that life's always easy or a cakewalk. Sometimes I think it's even a little bit more difficult when you are a believer because you have an enemy who wars against you, you know, and um, distracts us and uh, deliberately throws things our way. So uh, let's stay the course. Let's keep on keeping on. Because one day it's going to be worth it all when we see Jesus. So, well, today I want to begin uh, perhaps a two part uh, message here uh, with you. And it has to do with evangelism, it has to do with the fact that every believer is an evangelist. And you might not. Uh, always know, you know, what, what is God's place for me in the family of God, or how has he gifted me? You know, what is my spiritual gifts? And, you know, sometimes we put those, we put those little uh, tests out there, or, or surveys, or um, I don't know what you call them, anyway, but uh, we, go, we go through them to try to determine, you know, what our, what our gifts are. Uh, you know, uh, some of those are okay, but uh, you, need, you need to go right to the source and seek God's face. You know, um, what makes your heart beat a little bit faster? What is the thing that you cannot get away from as much as you try that God just keeps laying it on your heart and keeps intensifying it? Uh, but one thing each and every believer is called to do is uh, to be and to bear a, a witness of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in their life. It is a call upon each and every believer's life. And it is not just a call, it is a command. 
It is something that, that, that we're to do. It's something that we're to be a part of, something that we are privileged to bear the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are yet to believe. I shared a phrase or a, a word with you a few weeks ago um, that was kind of new to me, kind of putting into perspective people who are yet to come to know Jesus Christ. Um, this one guy was reading uh, his material, and he said they're, they're, they're pre-Christians. They're pre-Christians. You know, they're, they're uh, people who God is working on, people who God is drawing, people who God uh, uh, places uh, in our path. Some of them, you know, have been called uh, green apples or red apples. You know, a, a green apple just isn't ready yet, and uh, a red apple is, is, is ripe for the picking kind of thing. And we need to be sensitive to God's leading about not just sharing our faith, but how we share our faith and being sensitive to the Spirit's leading. And, you know, uh, before I get ahead of myself, I, I was just thinking, you know, a lot of people ask me how they can pray for me. And I appreciate that. A couple people already did that this morning. Uh, how you can pray for me in the new year? Um, and I guess the Spirit just kind of brought it through all of this uh, introduction of the service today. Pray that I am always sensitive to the leading of God's Spirit. Please, please do that for me. Um, I, don't wanna, I just don't want to preach for the sake of preaching. I want to preach what God wants preached. And... Uh, there would be no greater appreciation from my heart to yours that, that uh, you, would, you would pray that for me. And I'm praying, I'm praying Philippians 3.10 over you. And uh, I think we need to get real about this stuff, don't you? And, uh, but you know, we're all to do the work of the evangelist. That means that we're all to um, bear witness to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the fact of the matter is, if you are known as a Christian, and let me reiterate that and let it resonate with you. If you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. Not just about being a Christian are you to bear witness of Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior, but if you are known to other believers as a Christian, and especially out in the, in the, in the real world, where, there is, where the world is no friend of grace, if you are known in the place of employment, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, playground or in the schoolhouse or wherever you go, if you're, if you're known as a Christian, known to be a Christian, if that's the fact, then that in and of itself is an act of testimony to begin with. This is important. You know, just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you park a park yourself in a garage, and I'll use you, Joel, as an example, just because you're a mechanic doesn't make you a car. You know, you, you, you work on cars, and you serve people, you know, and, and I know why you've been at it a long time. It's just not about working on cars, because you know people drive those cars, and you care about those people. But, you know, just going to the church house doesn't make you a believer, Giving to the church and, and taking the, the, the or participating in the ordinances of the church don't, doesn't make you a Christian. But being to the cross and knowing that his, his, his blood has covered your sin and you have found forgiveness at the cross, that makes you a Christian. But the question before us this morning, are you known as a Christian? People know you as, as Don Bish. People know me as Ron Maines. And people know you as Tim and Tim and Tim, you know, and Carol and, and others, you know, and Kareen, David, you know, Earl, and yes, you too, Joy, and, uh, you know, all these things. I know that you're believers. I know you've trusted him, but are you just kind of, when somebody thinks of you, do they think of you as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus? And, you know, the fact is that if you're known as a believer, that in and of itself is an act of testimony. And that's a cool thing. So, use words when, when it's necessary, but be known as a Christian. And this morning, just uh, kind of redialing back a little bit uh, into the, the early church, you know, believers were originally called disciples. 
And these days, you know, sometimes words get a little bit skewed or a little bit blurry in what truly that meant and what it means today. Uh, a disciple of, of Jesus Christ is, is the fact of the matter not only to be known as a Christian, but what happens after one has come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. A disciple means that uh, I'm following after Jesus. I'm embracing his teachings. I am going to the wall if I have to, to, to live out Christ. To be a disciple of Christ is to be committed to the Christ of your salvation. It's just not about uh, making a decision in church. And I, I, and I recall when I came to the Lord, you know, as, as an 11-year-old boy, uh, on, on the throes of my father's situation, and uh, that was life-changing, that was life-altering. Totally different than being a Christian is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's what you're going to do with your Christianity. Um, what it, what's going to mean to you? What, uh, what sacrifices are going to be made? What commitment is going to be required? And sometimes out in a world that is no friend of grace, being, being uh, willing to be unpopular or, or uh, stay, you know, being, being in the gap, if you would. And so you can throw a lot of adjectives at that, but they were called, originally, they were called disciples, or they were called people of the way. That's a term used in Scripture too, right? People of the way. What way? His way. Not my way, but his way. People who were fishermen, people who were carpenters, people who were doing all these different kind of occupations, and they were people who put down their nets and put down their hammers and, 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 and followed Christ with all their hearts, even unto martyrdom. And so the question before us this morning is not that just the fact that you know that you've been to the cross and you've received forgiveness, but does a lost world, people who may not know Jesus or people who have ever uh, followed Christ as a disciple or people of the way, are you known in those circles as a Christian? Very important. Uh, we don't need to be uh, secret agents about this thing. We don't need to be closet Christians. Uh, does your, do your neighbors know that you're Christians by your attitude and your actions? You know, sometimes we don't always get along with other people. But, you know, we have to show them that we are the light of the world. And we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. I don't always get that right. A lot of times I don't get that right. But what it takes away from is the fact that uh, you are less known as a follower of Christ or a person who is a part of going in, in the way of Jesus or, or being a disciple because we don't act any differently than, than the rest of the world does. We don't like to be infringed upon. We, we don't like to have our rights threatened. Hey, we relinquished our rights, folks, when, when we were purchased with a price of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's not about always getting your way. There's nothing more divisive in, in a church than people who want to get their way instead of doing things his way. And so the question before us is, are we known as a Christian, and that in and of itself has given you a platform of testimony? People know that you're a believer. Not because you wear a cross around your, your neck or you, you, you hold a sign or, 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 or you preach a message or you teach a Sunday school class. Do they know you're Christians by the life that you live? They may not have ever heard a word from you. And so that's what we're talking about this morning. Believers in the early church called disciples, people of the way, uh, they were even given the label of, of Christian. They were first called Christians in Antioch. In the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 25 and 26, and this is about the apostle Paul, it said, and he left Tarsus and, uh, uh, to look for, for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for the entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, that is a passage of Scripture you've probably read a dozen of times or heard about a dozen of times. 
But uh, you see, the name Christian was not uh, given or declared among believers. The name Christian was kind of a slur, if you, were, if you would. It was kind of a, a, mock, a, a, a mock of those who were outside witnessing these people who said that they were his disciples or they were walking in the way of Christ or doing the things that Jesus did. People who were uh, observing the witness of the church, not in agreement with it, not liking it, but ridiculing it, making fun of it, first intended as a slur, but guess what? It stuck. The name stuck. And it wasn't invented by Christians. But what a testimony that must have been lived out by people who observed the church, outside of the church, people who are anti-Christ, people who would rather see all of these believers dead and done away with, to call them people with the name Christian, identifying them with Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful honor by lost people to make that observation. These are people who belong to him. It was a slur, folks. It was a declaration that these people are identified with this one who is called the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was the most common way then to identify those who were professing faith in Jesus Christ over, over all the world. And so, you know, sometimes we miss that, don't we? We think that uh, this, this was just kind of invented among, among people who were followers of Jesus, disciples, people who were of the way. No. This name was given, given as, as, a, as, a, as an identifying condemnation. You're a part of that one. You're a part of his testimony. You're a part of his witness. You're a part of his program. You don't go along with the ways of the world. You're kind of like the salmon who swims against the current and going in the other direction. When everything else is going one way, we are people who are most peculiar. Do we stand out? Do we make a difference? Not by what we, what we verbalize, but, but, but how we live. There's a biblical worldview on our minds by the renewing of our minds in Christ Jesus. There's a way in which we look at things through the mind of Christ. And the Bible says, do, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds in Christ Jesus. And so there's an identity thing going on here. But you know, in the world we're living in today, I think the church is having an identity crisis. Sometimes we look more like the world than we do than the one who we have allegiance to or the one who died for us or the one who uh, we're, we're, we're affiliated with as his disciples or people of the way or, or, or even being declared as a, a Christian because are we known out in the lost world by the lives that we're living instead of the, the message that we're preaching and are, are we sending mixed signals? Well, they preach a good message, but maybe not so much are they living, living that message out in, the, out in the world. And so the question before us is, do we live up to our, our namesake? Do we live up to our namesake? And I think those kind of questions need to be mulled over in our own minds. And I'm not saying that we always get it right. I'm not saying there's not room for growth. I'm saying there is a challenge before us. Sometimes we get all caught up with many things that seem so much more urgent, but we forget about what is so very important. Could you imagine the revival that God through his Holy Spirit would send upon his church if we took it seriously enough to be declared as followers of Jesus in a way that was once meant, for, was once meant as a slur against God's people? It stuck because they were real. They were faithful. They were consistent. They were intentional. They lived it 24-7. They went from house to house, worshiping the Lord, praying together, breaking bread, uh, being taught the apostles' doctrine. It was their life. 
I can remember as a young boy where our, my family's social life revolved around fellowship with God's people, God's church. It was the hub, if you would. The church was the, the center of everything we did and everything that we were or are in, in the family of, of God. It, it, it revolved around that. Today at Best Folks, the church is a spoke in the wheel because the church has grown very nominal over this whole dissertation about Christianity or being named a Christian as, as being a slur. Unmistakably, they were called Christians by those who were outside of the family of God because unmistakably, there was a life that was undeniably lived as he set the example for them to follow. May we be that church. May we be countercultural in this day. May we just don't go along with the program. May we be the church and may we be honored to be declared God's people or Christians by those who are not. What a compliment that is. So in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 11, these, these couple of verses we just read, the word means basically belonging, belonging to Christ, belonging to Jesus. So again, first, first intended as a slur, and then all, all that we've shared this morning, our identity with those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, do we live up to our namesake? And to be known as a, a, as a Christian paints for people away from what we used to be on our own by nature itself and now what we have become in Christ is new creatures having old things passed away and behold all things have become new I can't say that better than my brother Mark all, thi all things have become new is that true about you? all things have become new well that's kind of the position of our righteousness in Christ. There is definitely a process going on. There's a progression going on. There's a movement uh, in our, our lives that we need to be thankful for, that God is a very patient God. He is forming Christ in us. It is called that, that, that sanctification process. And I've had that discussion with many people. Are we wholly sanctified? Yes, in the eyes of God. We are wholly sanctified. We are His He's accomplished in us through Christ what he would do. And so we're presented holy and faultless one day before the, before the throne, all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet, he is still bringing me along. He is still working in, in my life so that I'm more consistent about not being questioned whether or not I'm known as a Christian sometimes, that I might be known as a Christian all the time. Walking in the way, walking in the precepts of God, living out, living out God's plan and purposes for, for our lives and, and to what we become in Christ by grace. But also it involves in sharing the hope of our salvation. So people who were known as being in the way or being a part of the way, being disciples of Jesus, followers of Christ, known by a lost world as, as being Christians, not only did they live the Christian life, but they also shared specifically the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. And so that is a part of this whole thing about, about Philippians 3.10 as well, that I may know him. Do you know that you can use the things that you're suffering to bring about the opportunity to share Christ with someone else who's going through something that you yourself have been through? Do you think you went through those things that you have suffered in life just because and praying that God would get you out of them? No, folks, we need to learn what it means to praise God in the midst of the storm so that in turn we can be used as an instrument of grace because somebody God will purposefully draw across your path or bring across your path is someone uniquely going through may be the very same thing that you've gone through. And by design, God aligned the planets for you, and you crossed their path. And who better to be an instrument of God's word and his gospel than somebody who's been there and has done that? 
And it is an opportunity not to just speak about the physical situation, but it is an eternal working of God's saving grace. And when we use his word, that's when the light goes on. I think I lost my uh, microphone here. Did I, Kevin? I'm good. Okay. So you've been there, you've done that, you understand that. But evangelizing begins with what we are, and our lives should shine as lights in, in the dark world that people will begin to take notice and ask of the hope that's also within us. In the book of Mark, you've got to go in the right direction in the Bible here. In the book of Mark, chapter 5, you know these passages this morning, verses 14 uh, down through 16. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Why would you light a lamp in the first place? Why would God have illuminated you by his Holy Spirit and enlightened you to the truth and the things of God, redeem you through the, the blood of the Lamb, forgive you of your sins, and uh, turn on your light as a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ for you not to share it? Why would that happen? Why would God redeem us and leave us here if we were not going to be a witness? That would mean that even though there was an internal change in our lives, God redeemed us for a purpose, and nobody would know that uh, that went on in the first place. We're here to go into all the world and preach the gospel to those who are pre-Christians, to those who are yet to believe. Nor does anyone light a, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and do something that ultimately is the purpose of it all in the first place. Glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know, one of the greatest things about a testimony and a witness, that it glorifies the Lord and it speaks to the fact that he is who he says that he is. And one of the greatest witnesses and proofs of God's true salvation is a changed life. God has changed us. God has redeemed us. He's given us a, a new desire for his word and for truth and to hunger and thirst after, after righteousness. And it's undeniable these lost people that were witnessing the early church, they called them Christians because they were living out Jesus. They were in the way of Christ doing things his way. They were going against the culture of the day. They weren't going along with the stream. These were people who were obviously followers of Christ, and it was a slur. One of the greatest witnesses and testimonies about Paul being thrown into prison and the irresistible move of God's Spirit upon that Philippian jailer. Hearing the praises of God when this man was being beaten and he was, being in sh he was put into shackles and he, and he was rejoicing in the midst of the storm. This guy had to know what was different about him. And if we're consistent in the Christian life and intentional, people are going to begin to wonder what is different about these people who are going through the same things that we're going through, but yet they just keep on keeping on. And there's something special. What is it that makes them different? What is it that makes them tick? And if you do it long enough, and if you do it consistent enough, and you keep your eyes focused on Christ, and he will sustain you to keep on keeping on, sooner or later, somebody's going to ask the question that is clarified for us in, in the book of 1 Peter. And they're going to ask of the hope that is within you. Why are you so weird? That's not in the Bible, by the way. Our conduct and, and how we relate to other people, and yes, even the lost and those who are even enemies would stand 
we would stand out to them in a way that would cause them to wonder what makes a difference. Hey, have you ever, you ever read uh, J.I. Packer? You ever read the theologian's book, J.I. Packer? Some of you guys have. Some of you know who I'm talking about. This is a cool statement. It's not complicated. That's why I like it. The waters for me kind of run shallow. It's got to be simple. And God's plan of salvation is the simple plan of salvation. Christ loves you. He sent Jesus. He died for you. He went to the cross to forgive you. And he saves you to the uttermost, bringing you from darkness into light. And he has a plan for you. But this is what J.I. Packer says. And he said that the basic definition of evangelism is Christians being Christians in the world. And that says a lot, guys. That says a lot, folks. Christians just need to be Christians. And you know what? Sometimes we are just not being Christians. That's the problem. And Packer nailed it. Christians being Christians, that's all God asks of us. Do we always get it right? Are we perfect with that? Absolutely not. When's the last time you got mad at the car in front of you because you didn't get through the red light in two seconds? Good grief. I've seen people lay on the horn. It's like the guy didn't even get a chance to put his foot to the gas, and you're honking at him. Really? Packard said, just a matter of Christians being Christians in the world. And then we're going to get labeled if we indeed take up that mantle. We're going to be called Christians by those who don't know Jesus. There's no greater honor to be called a follower of Christ, a disciple of Jesus, to be one who walks in the way of truth doesn't mean you doesn't mean you live in a cave somewhere and you sing kumbaya and you wait for Jesus to come back on a hillside somewhere no we are in this world but we are not of this world but God has us in this world to do his bidding and to make a difference and that people might see Christ in us the hope of glory and you know sometimes they see us when they see us shining the brightest when you're going through the depths of the worst. Charles Stanley, I remember him once saying, it's these kind of things, Rich, that resonate. Some of the greatest blessings of God upon his church and upon his people are disguised in the worst of circumstances. Do you understand that? That is true. That is true. And for us to say that God's people are never to suffer, that is wrong theology, folks. I don't like to suffer, and that's why we resist it. Whoever of you ever prayed once that God would bring suffering on your life? Not a one of you. If you have prayed that prayer, I'm sending you to counseling tomorrow morning. You have never prayed that prayer. Or if you think you have, you're lying in church. You need to walk the aisle. Or I'm missing something because I've never prayed it. But you know one prayer I have prayed? God, do what you need to do in my life to help me to become more like you. That's a tough prayer to pray too because you have just told the Lord whatever it takes. One of the greatest tools in the toolbox of heaven the suffering saints. It doesn't mean that we enjoy that or we like that, but oh, in the midst of those same things that Jesus experienced himself during his earthly ministry were the greatest outcomes. Paul, another one. You know, we always go there. He suffered like no one else. He said, I'm the chief of sinners, but, but he, he suffered much. But oh, did God use him greatly. So never think the things that you're going through are in vain because they're not. One day we'll understand it all when we see Jesus. You might understand it from looking back on it in life sometimes, but you might not ever. That's why we do walk by faith and not by sight. That's the only way we can walk. 
because God doesn't always put it there for us. That we That's where we trust him because he's trustworthy. He has seen us through so much, and he has proven himself to be who he says that he is. And so as a Christian, if our lives are making a difference and having that impact, sooner or later somebody is going to ask about that. And when this happens, you need to know how to respond. It doesn't mean you need to know how to preach a sermon. It doesn't mean you need to have a 10-point dissertation. It means you need to know what it means to get out of the Spirit of God's way that he might use you as a vessel and give you what you need to say. You don't have to come up with a gimmick or a slant or an angle. God's Word is sufficient. Just be a vehicle to allow it to be used through as a channel. That is the power of God unto salvation. Your influence, your backflips, you can't persuade anybody into heaven, but the Spirit of God can call his word down from heaven and allow it to change a person's heart and to turn the lights on where it can be very irresistible. Hey, you ever hear about the white knuckles on the pew? People trying to stand up against the the move of God's Spirit in their lives. And that's true, folks. I've seen it, and I've been a part of it, where people know that they need what God is offering. By the way, God's not here giving you cancer. God is giving you life eternal. And we need to let go of that pew that we grip on and we hold back from because, you see, it's, it's against that human nature to submit and be under the authority of something else and to be accountable to someone else. It, it goes against the selfish nature of man. But God wants to create in you a new nature. He wants to do a new work in you. He wants to give you a new heart of flesh. Not my way, but your way. And then we become people of his way. And we're known that way by people who are lost. What a beautiful thing that is. And we are to be able to stand in the state of readiness. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15, when that hope is asked of us, we need to be able to give a defense of the gospel. I need to know that Jesus died for me. And I know that he, 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 was, he was born, he was buried, and he, he, he was crucified and buried, and that he's risen again. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to get it all right. But you need to have a sincere heart in sharing it with heart, a heart of God that you have a loved one, you have a friend, you have a, you have a, a, a relative that without Jesus you know they're dying and they're going to hell one day. And we need to answer the call of bearing a witness of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and not worrying about being embarrassed or worried about what people are going to think of us. What you need people to think of you about is, unmistakably, that you live up to your namesake. You're a Christian, and that is something that somebody who has not yet come to know Christ knows about you. I'll tell you what, they don't always like our witness. They don't always like the ways of God because it goes against the selfish nature of man. But I will tell you this, people who do not know Jesus and who do not agree with you following Christ, one outcome that will happen is that they'll respect you. They'll respect you. And like that Philippian jailer, the whole picture painted before him, cried out to these prisoners, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And I hope that is a picture that happens in our lives. People see Christ in us. They see our stability. They see our hope. They see our promise. They see our readiness. They, they might not understand it. They might not uh, agree with it. They, they, they might not even be able to get their minds around it. But they cannot deny that it is something that is different and that it is something that they want and something that they need and they have needed all along but it just needed to be truth that was lived before them that it was very obvious that they don't have it. And we need to share Christ in us, who is indeed the hope of glory. 
And whenever this opportunity may arise, we need to share the gospel. And when it does, we should know the core elements of what it is and why people need to desperately take it seriously. As a Christian, do people take you seriously? I know when new people are new in Christ, you know, and they've changed, and the group that they've partied with and the people that they've run with, you know, oh, you know, Joe will get over that. He's just going through something, you know. It's just a fad. It's just, a, it's just you know, a change of life. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll get over that. He'll get over that. He'll be back with us. He'll be back doing the deal, you know, kind of thing. Oh, Joe, you know. But after a while, Joe starts growing in this, this newfound faith. And his desires change. What happened to Joe? And it's a very unsettling thing to all the people who used to know him in a certain light. And you see, when those changes happen, people start taking notice. Hey, there's something really true going on here. There's something real here. And they stand up and take notice. What is it? And old Joe, you know, he's not a, he's not a great theologian, and he doesn't even realize what's happened to him. He can't give you all the biblical answers. And sometimes, you know, we who were once legalistic, you know, oh, you know if you don't understand and cross the T's and dot the I's just right, you truly might not know the Lord. But let me share with you this as, as a way of closing. All old Joe knows is this. Hey, I don't know much about what's going on, and I'm more confused than I've ever been. But one thing I do know, I was once blind, but now I can see. And I don't know how I got there. I don't know what it's about. And I don't know why it's happened to me. But there's something different. And I want to continue to learn more about what God is doing in my life. And the old Joe, he'll catch up one day. But he's not on your timetable. And he's not under your judgment. He's been forgiven of his sin. And that's what I got. Father, we praise you. We thank you. Oh God, may we answer the call. May we be that evangelist. May we have this welling up within us that we cannot help ourselves but to share it and most importantly that we must live it just as the first church in the new in the first century lord given the name christian by those who were not a slur a mockery an identification Oh, God, only to know that honor of being known as a Christian by somebody who isn't. May that happen to us, oh, God. They might not agree with us. They might not see it our way. God, help us never to act more holy, holier than thou. Because it wasn't for your mercies we would have been consumed already. Fall on us. Holy Spirit, with a renewed fervor and urgency in these last days, in these storms that are blowing, that are making us all weary, and the things that people are suffering, and the things that we can't even speak of here this morning, out of confidentiality, Lord. Oh, God, would you use these things for your glory, that our lives, going through the same thing that anyone else goes through, God, that they who are outside of the family of God would glorify our Father who is in heaven. Oh God, may we be people who are known as your disciples, people who are of the way, people who are followers of Christ, people who are Christians. And may that be said of us, by people who aren't. May we have audience with them. May we be the ones that they turn to in the midst of their crisis, though we might have been the, 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 uh, 
brunt of their jokes and disdain and all these other things and the gnashing of teeth against the Christ, the Son of the living God. But may we be the one that they would turn to in the midst of trial or urgency in their lives because they realize there's something different about us. And may they see Christ in us and ask of the hope that's within us. Oh God, the fields are white on the harvest, but the laborers are few. God, do a work in our hearts this year. This might be our last year, Lord. This might be it. This might be our last day. This might be it. Everyone whom we've spoke of this morning never would have believed that they'd be going through the things that they're going through today. We're vulnerable. We're weak. Father, this life is temporary. We're here just for a little while. We're but a vapor that appears for a moment, then vanisheth away. Help us to be about your business in this window of time, Lord, because the window is closing and one day we'll be in your presence. The night is coming when no man is going to be able to work, Lord. While we work, while, may we work while it is yet day. Father, what a time for your church. What a time for your people to be known as Christians among the lost. Oh God, we praise you, we thank you, we give you all the glory. Go with us today, Lord, that we might be your people. And as J.I. Packer said, the whole definition of this evangelism is simply this, that Christians are to be Christians in the world. We praise you and thank you, and it's in Christ's name. Amen. May God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon.